Good evening. I'm Tavi Tyler. And I'm Kate France. And tonight, we talk about pandemics throughout history. So, grab a hermetically sealed beverage. It's time for a night in. Because we're, we're quarantined. Yeah, no, we're stuck in here. So, Ultra was cancelled. And for people who don't know what that is... It is a music festival that takes place in Miami. Over 100,000 people attend annually, but amid the outbreak of the coronavirus, the event planners are now canceling the big show. And it was supposed to bring to Miami the musical talents of the Chainsmokers, Marshmallow, the Subtronics, my brother-in-law, DJ Tandem. It's, It's a big deal. Or was, but with concerns about the virus mounting, More than just music events have been canceled. Yeah, in Orlando, H-I-M-S-S, it's a huge IT conference, may be canceled after several prominent guests like Cisco and Amazon have dropped out. People are working from home, and there's been talk about postponing the Tokyo Olympics. However, the coronavirus is not the first of its kind. Though it's technically a novel virus, there have been other coronaviruses in the past, and there will be others in the future. Remember the SARS outbreak in 2003? It was actually called SARS-associated coronavirus. Huh. But it was shortened into SARS because it's easier to say, which is why the general population has avoided, until now, all of the variations of the jokes associating the coronavirus with corona beer. Lyme disease does not go well with coronavirus, and you should be ashamed of yourself, Larry. But in spite of humanity's attempts to keep it light, the coronavirus is no joke. Though the pool of data surrounding the virus has been collected in a relatively short time, it has already been shown that the virus is more deadly than the flu, with about a 3.4% mortality rate. And though there are more deadly diseases out there, COVID-19, the official name for the coronavirus, is spreading quickly. So, naturally, as self-preserving, rationally thinking members of society, we've taken precautions. Surely it's rational to lose confidence in stock markets most affected by the virus, buy up all of the personal protective equipment, spread xenophobia, and insist on using hand sanitizer to slow the spread of the illness. (laughs) Wait, did I say rational? In our defense as a species, it would be pretty wise for us to have an alarmist reaction to the rapid spread of an infection given our history with communicable illnesses. Before the invention of antibiotics in the 20th century, people died from infection at an alarming rate. And though modern medicine has allowed us to mitigate the spread of bacterial illnesses, viruses are still much harder illnesses for us to treat. Which makes it harder to slow the spread of viral pandemics and easier to spread mass panic. Mass panic's in our DNA, though, and we can look at history to see why that is. Historically, illnesses have wreaked havoc on humanity. Even people who don't know anything about history can name one very significant occurrence from the Middle Ages. The plague. The first thing everyone gets wrong about the plague is the idea that it happened only once. However, the plague is basically the fast and the furious of historical events and has devastated humanity on multiple occasions. But the Black Death of the Middle Ages was the first major outbreak of plague in Europe. And because it's European history, we learned about it in school. But because it's not the first pandemic to wipe out human populations, it is referred to as the second plague pandemic. The first plague pandemic is referred to as the Plague of Justinian, and it occurred in the early Middle Ages from 541 to 542 CE. Though the death tolls are unconfirmed, it could have killed 13 to 26 percent of the world's population. The plague reoccurred occasionally for centuries, but was nowhere near as virulent as the initial outbreak. That is, until the Black Death. The Black Death hit in 1347 and lasted until 1351, and in this period of time it's likely to have killed over 100 million people worldwide. For perspective, this was about 20% of the world's population at the time. (laughs) Jeez, a 1 in 5 chance of death, huh? You literally have better odds in Russian Roulette. Let me go get my six-shooter. And just like the Plague of Justinian, it was spread by flea bites. Now everyone thinks the plague was started by rats. But rats only deserve half the blame. Rats are the host for the bacteria that causes plague, but the flea is responsible for the transfer of the bacteria from rat to human. 
So do you want to hear the really gross details about how it spread? Have I ever not wanted to hear the really gross details? The bacteria, known as Yersinia pestis, originates in a host mammal, usually a rodent. Some mammals can remain unaffected by the bacteria and are known as asymptomatic carriers, while others are affected and die from the infection. When the infected host dies, the fleas, who are also infected, transfer to another mammal and infect it, beginning the transmission cycle. The bacteria affects the flea by growing in its midgut and preventing it from feeding. As it starves, the flea makes a futile attempt to feed, and the ingested blood from the new host dislodges bacteria in the esophagus of the flea, forcing it to regurgitate the bacteria into the new host, thus further spreading the infection. Ugh, it's not just bacteria. It's bacteria vomited by a flea. And it was through this process that it slowly worked its way into Europe from Asia. I, I have four cats and a dog. This flea thing's going to be my newest neurosis. So there are three types of plague, septicemic, pneumonic, and the most common, bubonic. And you should take a guess at which one you think is the worst. There's a difference. Literally all of those sound like the worst. <laughs> yeah, and you might hate to hear it, but if you had to have one of the three, the one you want is bubonic plague. Lovely. The bubonic plague has the highest rate of recovery where pneumonic plague is 95% fatal, and septicemic plague is nearly 100% fatal. And I know the bubonic plague is not the one anyone wants because it manifests as gross oozing lumps. It's better than certain death, right? Although, if it's not treated, it too is almost certain death. It also can worsen into pneumonic plague, which is transmissible person to person via sputum droplets, so there's that. <laughs> but... Of course. Back then, n no one knew that coughing on someone was an assassination attempt. The Black Death was devastating. But these illnesses were so devastating in part because no one knew what germs were, and public health services did not exist. In fact, medical science was surprisingly stagnant during the Middle Ages, and some of the proposed causes for the plague at the time included bad air or miasma, planetary alignment, the wrath of God, the mercy of God, the wells being poisoned by Jewish people, lepers, earthquakes, pilgrims, people with psoriasis, and people with acne. <laughs> people with acne. Imagine being a teenager in the Middle Ages and getting blamed for the plague. Jeez, like you don't already have enough problems. Now how are you ever going to get someone to dance with you around the Maypole? Maybe one day I'll get a date after I grow out of this acne and these plague scars. And I'm not trying to horrify you when I say this, but the plague is still around. In 2017, an outbreak of the plague killed 170 people in Madagascar. And the plague is so common in Madagascar that there is actually a plague season from October to April. No. No, why? Well... There are a number of factors that contribute to this, but the most glaring of them is poverty. People in rural areas have little access to sanitary living conditions and clean water. Sewage is poorly managed, and in these conditions, rats and fleas thrive. Public health education is also minimal, and access to resources like antibiotics are limited. And I'm never leaving my house again. <laughs> yeah, but what if you manage to find a mask? Well, wearing a mask didn't help slow down the extremely high death rates during the Spanish influenza, so I'm not sure how much help it will be for me. That's probably because of the way they were using masks. Incorrectly. <laughs> so, before I talk about the Spanish flu, I want to just say that Spanish flu has very little to actually do with Spain. It was present in Spain during 1918 and 1920, just like it was present literally all over the world. This disease even infected people in the Pacific Islands and the Arctic. The thing is, Spanish papers weren't censored from writing about the disease the way news sources were in the US, UK, Germany, and France, since they were fighting a little thing you may have heard of called World War I. Because of Spain's neutrality, the flu was nicknamed the Spanish flu since to everyone reading the papers, it must have seemed like it was way worse there than anywhere else. The nickname Spanish flu is therefore misleading, since the real name of the disease may sound familiar. H1N1. Yep, this was our first pandemic started by good old H1N1. While it would not be the last, it was the deadliest. The disease infected 
500 million people and killed anywhere between 17 and 50 million people, though there are some sources that place that number at 100 million. The strain of H1N1 was particularly devastating due to many factors. World War I set the stage for large groups of migrating people, damaged infrastructure, malnutrition, poor hygiene, and hospitals already overrun with wounded. This made it very easy for those infected to die of secondary bacterial infections. The virus may also have triggered a cytokine storm, an immune system response that sets off a dangerous internal inflammatory process. This is important because this pandemic was unique in the heightened numbers of victims dying between the ages of 20 and 40. People with strong immune systems were the most affected by this illness. This is in contrast to most global pandemics, disproportionately affecting the very young and the elderly. And the H1N1 virus didn't just go away. It still exists today, though in a mutated form. The famous swine flu pandemic of 2009 was an outbreak of the H1N1 flu virus. And if anything was perfectly constructed to disrupt markets, it was the fear that the Spanish influenza had returned for revenge to wipe out another chunk of the Earth's population. I'm going to read you a quote from a 2009 Brookings article titled, The Swine Flu Outbreak and Its Global Economic Impact. It says, The swine flu, caused by a strain of the influenza virus common in pigs and having symptoms similar to that of influenza, continues to grow in the U.S. and globally. Fearing this outbreak may lead to pandemic, stock markets have declined, and tourism, food, and transportation industries are suffering from a lack of public confidence. This sounds familiar. The interview within the article is very interesting. Keeping in mind that we were in a recession at the time, one question asks, how can this outbreak lead to further economic decline? And the response was, if the disease is declared a pandemic and the case fatality rate worsens and mild panic begins to appear, then the real economy will start to bear the brunt of the disease outbreak. We estimated in our study that a mild scenario would cost the global economy about $360 billion, and an ultra scenario up to $4 trillion within the year of the outbreak. This is already reflected in our current estimated cost of COVID-19. The Guardian stated, quote, Oxford Economics warned that the spread of the virus to regions outside Asia would knock 1.3% off global growth this year, the equivalent of $1.1 trillion in lost income. And hence a follow-up question in the previously mentioned article asks, for both investors and consumers, what lessons can be learned from past outbreaks? And the response was, it is not the deaths or the periods away from employment that cause economic activity to decline during a pandemic. It is the disruption to markets caused by a loss of confidence and change in spending patterns driven by fear. Which is why, for inexplicable reasons, people are buying antibacterial hand sanitizer to combat a virus. A virus. Yes, and people who are not healthcare providers are buying up all the N95 masks, which is cool and all, except that as a healthcare provider, I can explain that every year I am refitted for the proper fit of this mask and I am trained in how to use it. So a layperson not being fitted for and using this mask without training is about as effective at preventing illness as the pullout method is effective at preventing pregnancy. But that is what we do. And that is what we are conditioned to do. We can't help ourselves. And so yet again, markets are affected. Panic sets in. People disproportionately buy resources. Xenophobia takes over. And we see the same patterns over and over. And in some ways, this isn't bad. Being reminded of good health practice is sometimes necessary. Yeah. You know when it's a good time to wash your hands? Always. It's always a good time to wash your hands with regular soap and warm water. And it's always a good idea to cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze. But it's never a good idea to start blaming people for an illness that is not their fault. In the same way Jewish people were not poisoning wells to give everyone the plague, Chinese people aren't deliberately giving everyone COVID-19. And it certainly wasn't cultivated in a Chinese bioweapons lab. Thanks for that, Fox News. While it's understandable to be afraid of something that can hurt you, that you can't see or hear, 
it isn't appropriate to direct that fear and frustration towards groups of people who bear no fault. This xenophobic behavior is typical of human beings. It's reactionary and not exclusive to pandemics. People lash out when they feel scared and helpless. Like the aggression directed at Muslims after 9-11, the slurs directed at the Chinese in wake of COVID-19 are inappropriate, racist, and counterproductive. Which gives credence to the importance of getting accurate information about the spread of illnesses from accurate sources. Some websites are a lot more sexy and interesting to read. Some spread fear, some spread sensational and false information, and it's easy to see why people would want to read that. It's interesting and engaging, but these sources that are entertaining can often spread harmful information, which is why sources like the CDC or the World Health Organization should be a person's go-to. The following message is from the World Health Organization, and it is as follows. If you are not in an area where COVID-19 is spreading, or have not traveled from an area where COVID-19 is spreading, or have not been in contact with an infected patient, your risk of infection is low. It is understandable that you may feel anxious about the outbreak. Get the facts from reliable sources to help you accurately determine your risk so that you can take reasonable precautions. Emphasis on the word reasonable. The CDC offers a similar message and gives the following advice for how to prevent the spread of illness. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue. Then throw the tissue in the trash. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces using regular household cleaning spray or wipe. May I suggest your phone, wallet, keys, purse straps, and steering wheel. And of course, wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before eating, and after blowing your nose, coughing, or sneezing. If soap and water are not readily available, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. Always wash hands with soap and water if hands are visibly dirty. With all of that said, illnesses are here to stay, and it is important to set up good habits that promote public health awareness. With worsening global warming, we're likely to see an increase in global illnesses. So it's important now to not only educate ourselves on how to prevent the spread of illness, but also to promote public health services in areas where education and resources are limited. We don't have ignorance as an excuse anymore. Pandemics are inevitable. We share this planet with innumerable microscopic organisms that are just waiting to mindlessly destroy us as a species. That said, we have the opportunity to limit the effects of a pandemic and save lives by practicing common sense hygiene habits. And and remaining calm. So calm. Zen out. Don't watch Fox News. And and maybe not CNN either. Unless it's Anderson Cooper. Oh yeah, listen to him. He's had like malaria like a million times and he keeps calm. Why don't you just grab a beverage and mainline all of our episodes? Kate's voice can be your ASMR guide and I'll periodically shout and keep your blood pressure elevated. You'll feel so alive. Try it now for free on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And good night, everyone. Night!